the Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire for a safe and secure society. This is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. If you're ready to stand on the line, if you're ready to fight back and serve it to the criminals trying to enslave you and steal your wealth through monetary creation and exorbitant taxation, you're in the right place. Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Today's guest is the very popular, always clever, exceedingly creative, and vastly patriotic Glenn Tate. Glenn, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you. I, I think people need to quit listening now because whatever I say after that introduction is going to be a huge letdown. So, listeners, please quit listening. No, I'm sorry, Mark. I shouldn't do that to you. That's terrible. <laughs> now, since the last time we talked, uh, the Swiss franc is up 30%. The Russian ruble is down 30%. Uh, Bitcoin has crashed and burned, but uh, the lead brass alloy, alloy known as glentadium is holding steady is ammo still your apocalyptic currency of choice oh absolutely um i i have some money i i have not gone into gold and silver um heavily uh, because i've been going into ammunition by the way if i had more money that i could put into things i would put it into gold and silver i'm not saying gold and silver is a bad idea i think it's a great idea um i'm in a little bit of a different situation because the team is real and uh, the team's business plan um, for for a collapse is to um, you know be security contractors only for good people by the way and to basically guard good people and uh, you know be fed in the process just as is described in the books um, so it makes even more sense for us to have a ton of ammunition than necessarily have gold and silver so I'm not putting down gold and silver I think for most people who you know don't maybe have a team like that gold and silver would be a great thing because you could hire a team like us so uh, there you go I'm not accepting uh, you know applications or anything I'm just saying uh, that's kind of how it works so yeah ammunition is is fantastic uh, it never it never goes down in price you're never gonna you know I mean, it, it levels off a little bit but you're never gonna say oh geez hey if you buy ammunition smart I mean you don't go into the into the, the scare times uh, it lasts forever, um, and you're going to use it. I mean, if you're a recreational shooter, you're going to use it. So even if nothing bad happens, um, you're still you're still doing great. And if something bad happens, it's absolutely invaluable. So I'm a huge proponent of Glenn Tatum, not just because you gave that name to it and my name is in it. I mean, that has nothing to do with it, but Glenn Tatum is a great investment. And by the way, I work with Ammo uh, Supply Company, and uh, they they're great for getting you those big, anchor chunks, as I call them, you know, a case at a time sort of thing. I mean, they have smaller amounts, but I mean, I'm a big fan of getting a case as an anchor and then getting some boxes now and again when you're at a, you know, sporting goods store or whatever. I mean, kind of, I I like both approaches, the big, the big buy and then lots of, of little buys too. Um, Sort of dollar cost averaging on the little boxes, basically, is how that works. And and you can't print ammo like, uh, like dollars or, (laughs) or the, the, European Central Bank just announced a trillion dollar uh, quantitative easing uh, printing spree that they'll be doing it over the next 18 months. So uh, that's just going to be that much more paper currency sloshing around on the globe. Do you think that uh, makes things more stable or less stable? <laughs> um, objection, leading question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, exactly. <laughs> uh, it is. It is uh, <laughs> um, no, it's, things are much less stable, and we're all just waiting for whatever event or events it will take for all of this money that's out there that doesn't seem to be circulating as fast as it otherwise could be because, you know, the, the economies of the world are, are sort of tampered down by a variety of things, not the least of which is too much government. But once all that money starts roaring, 
um, it'll just take off and, and that money will go somewhere. Of course, the only way for central banks to get money back in is to raise interest rates to very high levels so that they're basically soaking up all the currency that they sent out with the high interest rates. But, of course, that's impossible um, in the U.S. and in Europe and really the world because um, all of the economies of the world, um, U.S. in particular, are completely dependent on debt, and that is cheap debt. And, you know, if interest rates, if the prime rate went back up to 17% and a bunch of mortgages out there are prime plus whatever, um, you, you just you can't have the economy the way it's set up now uh, with 17% interest rates plus just think of what the debt service would be on on treasury bills. It I mean, it'd be astronomical. I mean, there's there's literally not enough income um, in the country to to pay those bills. So th they can't they can't do anything about it once it once it busts open. And the question is when it'll do it. And by the way, that's not to say there's no inflation now, and that we're all waiting for the big you know flood of dollars. I mean, there's amazing inflation now. Of course, when the consumer price index doesn't count things that nobody ever uses like food and energy, um, <laughs> then, um, you know, it's easy to say there's a low inflation rate, but I, I was buying steaks the other day and I just, I about died. I went back to hamburger. I couldn't believe it. Uh, so there is real inflation now, but I mean the really bad stuff that'll come, come roaring. Um, and think about all the folks that, that held, um, I don't know, mortgages like in Poland and things like that. A lot of folks had uh, mortgages that were denominated in Swiss francs. Now you have to pay them back in a currency that's worth 30% more. So you just, you know, lost 30%, or you have to pay 30% more for your your mortgage now. Um, and so anyway, yeah, it's it's got to happen. I'll I'll be honest. I think this should have happened sooner. But everything that we're seeing is exactly what you know alternative economists like you and and all of your guests too uh, have been predicting. So. No surprises, but I'll tell you, a 30% appreciation in a currency in one day is a little bit shocking, even even to me. Yeah, it's it's impossible to to price the risk for that, especially for like uh, forex traders. A lot of forex traders uh, had to close the doors after that. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. And you've mentioned this before, and so have your guests. All these derivatives are based on interest rates being low or, or stable, I guess, and and stock prices not being volatile and all of these things. And then when you have these, these volatile, volatile swings in currency prices and in stock prices, it's, it's just destructive with derivatives. And as we all know, there's, we don't even know how many trillions, quadrillions, I'm not making that number up. That's a real number, as you know, how many quadrillions of dollars of derivatives are out there. And that's the way that, that all of this can rip things apart because, um, the dollar just going up or going down a lot in a day is bad for all of us. But when it's magnified like it is with derivatives, then it's really, really bad because now, uh, you know, $100 trillion of making this up of, of derivatives now become due because the bet that was placed on the value of the dollar or value stocks or whatever it might be, energy prices, uh, now now is called in and nobody has $100 trillion. And, you know, I guess you could try to print it really quickly, but that in and of itself would be destructive. So that's how this can unravel because of the magnification with the derivatives. It just like what we saw with the with the Swiss franc, uh, like you said, thirty percent is it's unheard of, it's unprecedented. We've never seen uh, a one day move like that. So when they're pricing the risk for these things, um, they're using historical data, and and. Mm -hmm. And we're in unprecedented times where uh, the volatility is just off this off the charts. So you there's there's no historical data to put into your risk models to be able to uh, figure out how to hedge against this stuff. So you, all of this stuff is all mispriced, and it's just like you said, this derivatives thing could absolutely blow up in our face. And uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, 2015 might be the year. Do you think 2015 is the year your prepper fiction series, 299 days, goes from being fiction to being history? Entirely possible. And I always say this, and, and I'm sincere about this. I, I, I don't know dates, and I, don't, I try not to pick times, but so many things have been pointing you know, in my life. I don't know about the – I'm not going to comment on the rest of the world here, but just in my own life that, that point to – 2015 being the year, and I don't want people to take that as, 
oh, I'm, I'm quote, predicting anything. I'm not predicting anything. Um, I know this, this is sort of watered down and anticlimactic, but I'll say this. It really wouldn't surprise me if 2015 is a year because I don't want to get out and start predicting things um, for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want people, you know, relying on what I say. I don't want one person out there, even a single person out there, to go and, you know, sell their house and, and you know, move to Idaho or something like that based on things that they're hearing. I, you know, I, I want them to think about it and take in all the evidence. And then the other thing is I don't want to be the guy, nobody wants to be the person who predicts something, you know, every year and it doesn't happen. That being said, um, and it would take too long to describe and it's, it's kind of, I don't know, too detailed, but many, many things in my own life um, are indicating that big changes are coming up in 2015 and we're seeing – we're seeing all the, the preceding signs that you would expect for a big economic collapse. We're seeing them right now. And so uh, 2015 would not surprise me at all. I haven't felt this strongly about a time that something might happen in quite some time. That being said, I've been wrong up until now. So let's please, you know, get that out there because I need to be honest with everybody. And then if it doesn't blow up in 2015, it's important for folks to not get complacent. I mean, I'm with you. Uh, nobody wants to be Lindsay Williams who's uh, scratching out the date and writing a new one every uh, six to nine months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, if you're if you're getting ready now and, and you've got a an inkling or a pretty solid feeling that 2015 might be the year, that just means you're going to prep harder. And we all know it's going to come crashing down at some point. And so you're going to get more prepping done in 2015 anyway, so there's no downside. As long as you don't do two things when it comes to prepping, number one, break the law. Um, that would be primarily weapons violations. That's a really bad idea. And the worst survival plan there is is being in federal prison, by the way. And the second thing you shouldn't do uh, is go into debt, is get really freaked out and go into debt and buy a bunch of stuff that you can't afford. That's not good either. So as long as you're prepping within those two limitations, and, and most people do prep within those limitations, um, you should be fine. And that's why I say there's no downside, provided you're, for example, not going into debt. Now, uh, your book series might make good history after the collapse, but I'm afraid it might not pass common core standards. It's a little heavy <laughs> on the Constitution, Patriot stuff. What, what other aspects of the 299 Days series might not agree with common core standards? <laughs> well, there's um, a pretty obvious reference to God, um, a continuing reference, without using the, the, the term God, um, which I did, by the way, because I didn't want people who are not believers or are kind of on the fence to sort of reject the, the whole series and not listen to the, the, the God-focused message um, in the books. Um, also, by the way, I grew up and live in western Washington, the Seattle area, which is one of the most godless parts of the United States, perhaps of the world, and uh, I've just become used to not saying the G word or the J word because people will quit listening and walk away, and, um, you know, I actually want to persuade them to prep and, of course, to, I don't know, con consider God. It's been the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life, so um, I hope it works for them, too. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's the uh, religious references. Um, there's a whole lot of guns. I'm sure that's not common core material. Um, there are people being self-reliant, um, and then there are examples of the government not being able to take care of people like the government's promised, and the self-reliant actually taking care of themselves. And then, horror of horrors, the self-reliant, charitable, decent people, the patriots, um, taking care of others that the government can't take care of. And by, when I say the patriots are taking care of people, I don't mean they're, you know, handing them their, you know, their MRE or something like that and making them turn in their guns. I mean, they're, they're guarding their farms or their gardens or they're providing medical care for them or they're, you know, helping them fix things or get water systems going. I mean, real help, not handouts. Um, those would be some things that Common Core would despise. Um, I've never really thought of this because it, everything about Common Core would be antithetical to everything in 299 days. So uh, let's just go with a categorical everything is the answer. <laughs> now, Jimmy's ticked off because I wouldn't let him wear his Charlie Hebdo shirt to work. Um, now, are you happy with the way the Paris attacks have been exploited to increase global surveillance and uh, unite world leaders to crack down on freedom? 
objection, leading question once again, but I like how you do that. That's good stuff. Um, yeah, it's that that was sort of a predictable outcome of all of this. Um, yeah, and we're seeing that where the French said that they're going to uh, hire 2,600 more anti-terror officers. Um, of course, France has got real terrorism concerns of a good chunk of their country um, believes in a worldview that wants France to become ruled by Sharia law. So, yes, they have real terrorist problems. I don't mean terrorists in the sense of, like, sophisticated, I'm sure there are probably sophisticated plans uh, the bad guys have to attack France. But France has so many Muslims who absolutely detest French culture and Western culture in general that France has, you know, low-intensity conflict problems. I mean, you'll remember a few years ago, uh, one summer in particular, Paris you know, we saw a lot of low-scale, you know, looting. It was particularly bad. It saw all kinds of fires and, and all kinds of – it was a it was an intifada is what it was. And so France has a lot of problems. I'm not saying they don't uh, when it comes to terrorism. But the 2,600 officers um, are going to have to have something to do. It kind of reminded me of the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. It was just alcohol and tobacco. And then, then they needed something to do in the 30s, and lo and behold, there's the uh, – you know, the Firearms Act, and now it's a $200 tax stamp to get a suppressor, even though, you know, suppressors are good to protect your hearing, but there had to be something for these ATF agents to do. So then they started regulating, you know, suppressors and stuff like that. Um, uh, another, you know, tragic part of the Paris attacks, I think it's pretty obvious what happens when you have a completely disarmed population, including apparently most of the police force uh, is disarmed in France. Um, and, you know, a couple guys with AKs, I didn't see if they had body armor or not, but even if they did, um, you know, in, in quite a few neighborhoods in at least the rural parts of the United States, um, that would have that attack wouldn't have lasted nearly as long as it did. Um, but this isn't a gun control discussion. Yeah, you know, the French, you know, it's a socialist country, and uh, what, do you, what do you expect um, other than the exploitation of a tragedy to grow the size of government? And it was it was a really good uh, example of what happens when when you take uh, the guns out of the hands of the law-abiding people, and only the criminals can get a hold of them. Now, your state of Washington is sort of a microcosm of the rest of the country. The space between the right and the left is really growing. Uh, the people of Washington have two very different paths they envision. Um, do you think that's true? Oh, absolutely, and, and more and more. Yeah, we see it. And the middle is not the middle in the sense of being politically in the middle. This is my viewpoint, and I spend some time looking at polling numbers, by the way. Um, and I think the, the middle has largely become apathetic. And you've got kind of the, the Uber MSNBC people and the Uber Fox News people and driving the discussion. And uh, the, the rest of the country basically doesn't care and doesn't want to listen. And, I mean, can you blame them? I mean, if those are your two sources of, of – political intellectual thought um you know then <laughs> that's that's a discussion I'd, I'd rather talk about the seahawks by the way than you know msnbc versus fox news but yeah the it's getting more and more extreme and um as as more and more liberties are taken away and now speaking from our side of the you know, the right side um we have we have fewer and fewer things we can do i mean it's not like the old days where you could write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and persuade people. I mean, all that, I call it the civics lesson stuff, you know. I guess they don't teach civics in high school anymore, but when I was in high school, they did, and they, they told us that, you know, the best argument wins, and the legislature debates things and comes up with the best policy, and and you can, you know, get enough votes on the city council to, to elect people, and then you can change things that way. All these things we've been told, you know, are so old-timey America that they don't apply anymore. And that means that as we can change things less and less, uh, most people get apathetic. But the people who don't get apathetic start getting a little bit more strident and a little bit more vocal. And I think we're we're seeing that, especially on the right, because, of course, the left owns the government. I mean, they, you know, they get what they want out of the government. And so they don't have the problem that we do. Um, but I, I've noticed that, that there's there's less and less, Let's just sign a petition, and we can change things. I mean, nobody believes that anymore, and they should. Now, beyond the abyss that separates Democrats and Republicans, we also have a growing schism within the Republican Party. What's causing that? Oh, my goodness. The, 
the absolute ineffective um, nature of establishment mainstream Republicans um, that, that I mean, have had like a couple decades to get like one thing right once in a while and, and still have managed to screw that up. I mean, look at the, the immigration promises in the 2014 election and, and how mainstream Republicans are, are backpedaling on that. How many times, you know, a representative um, of yours that you sort of know and track, how many times have they said one thing, Republicans now I'm talking about, and then once they're sworn in, they're like a different person. And the worst and most pathetic thing is when they campaign as a conservative or a libertarian, I guess, and then they get elected, and then they get sworn in, and they turn into a mushy, squishy establishment person. And then what's worse than that, they come home to the district, and they're at some town hall meeting, and they're telling you that they're going to make sure there's no illegal immigration. You raise your hand and you say, yeah, but you voted for this, this, and this. So that's what it is. Um, and who knows if the Republican Party can be reformed. I've quit caring about the Republican Party a long time ago. I, I noticed something was up when I would refer to Republicans as they and them instead of us and we. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be really, really hard for people out there who are well-informed uh, to say that the Republican Party is going to save America. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Katie Armor offers affordable body armor, including level 3 trauma plates made of AR-500 steel. They can endure multiple rounds from pistols and rifles up to 7.62 NATO. Their plates are available with Rhino Linings coatings to reduce spa. Go to katiearmor.com, that's C-A-T-I armor.com today. Hi, this is Kim Jong. Your country no good to make friends. Why turn off the internet? I was trying to watch interview on the YouTube. And this is Vladimir Putin. What's happening for oil prices? Not so good for ruble. I'm hoping I don't find out you guys is involved. Maybe you need go PrepperRecon.com. Check it out, supply store, in case somebody turn off your internet. Or could be turning off your electricity. These things happen. They have a so good everyday carry concealed carry sling with patches more cool than a Dennis Rodman. And having molly compatible individual first aid kits with IBD, chest seal, quick clot, tourniquet, EMT shears, and much more. Even when I don't wear a shirt, I having IFAC from Prepper Recon with me. So go to PrepperRecon.com and click store tab on the top of the home page. While you still can. So uh, Jeb would be the first member of the Bush family to run for president that's not a member of the globalist occult society, the Skull and Bones. But uh, I still refuse to vote for him. Uh, how do you feel about Jeb Bush? Um, well, he's, he's the classic example of, of an establishment Republican. His, his falling all over himself um, for illegal immigrants is particularly annoying. By the way, Republicans, can, can we just be candid here? Could I just give you some observations from a place I spend a lot of time at, which is the taco truck? Yes, on the West Coast, we have these food trucks that go around. They have amazing food. They're, they're run by awesome people. I love, I love taco truck you know, business entrepreneurs, and I talk to them, and they're great. And they have these little, uh, these little newspapers, um, and they're written in Spanish um, for a lot of their customers. And... And I look at them. I don't read Spanish, but I'm pretty good at looking at pictures. And a lot of them are political cartoons about, you know, John Boehner being stupid or, uh, you know, George W. Bush, you know, being stupid and all these things. And Republicans like Jeb Bush, listen to me, please. If you think your strategy is to be pro-immigrant, which, of course, means pro-illegal immigrant for most of these people. Everybody's for legal immigration. That's not even an issue. But if you think that you're going to be getting all these Latino votes, you're stupid. You need to go to a taco truck and read the Spanish language newspapers to find out what's really going on. Quit listening to consultants who get paid millions of dollars to tell you to run this, this kind of Facebook campaign to target this group of people. Quit listening to them. They're taking your money, candidates. They're taking your money. Go to a taco truck and figure out how life really works. 
Now, I did the cleanest, dirty shirt thing in 2012. Uh, of course, I voted for Ron Paul in the primaries. Then in the general election, I saw my vote for Romney as a vote against Obama. But I'm putting all of my fellow Republicans on notice. That ain't happening again. Either we get a Rand Paul or a Justin Amash on the ticket, or I'll do a write-in. Even if it means losing to Hillary or giving Obama a third term. Uh, if we all made that pledge and informed the rest of the party, would it make a difference? Yeah, I think so. Um, and here's how it, it would in, in real terms. Um, candidates, Republican candidates, they really don't care what people actually think, but they do care about uh, money, and they also care about volunteers. I mean, there's a there's a lot of people that are needed, as they used to say, to stuff envelopes, but, of course, that's so 1990s, and there are no more envelopes anymore. But all kinds of volunteers that are needed, um, and, of course, the money um, is needed. A lot of it comes from big corporations. But, you know, there's still a need for grassroots, you know, support out there um, in the districts that are not gerrymandered, and most of the districts are gerrymandered. But so that's, that's how to hit them. Um, let them know that you're not going to support them. And another thing that amazes me, and I, I've never understood this, it, it's completely irrational, but I see it all the time. I call it the produce aisle uh, phenomenon. And that's there will be, there'll be some elected official, you know, maybe a local elected official, who will take some stand on something that's stupid. And then they're in the produce aisle at the grocery store, and and they bump into a constituent who says, hey, why'd you vote for that? That's crazy. I'm not voting for you anymore. I've had a yard sign for you in my yard for the past three elections, and our kids go to school together. And all of a sudden, it's amazing. A lot of these politicians will cave and backpedal, I mean, over, like, awkward produce aisle con confrontation. And so... You know, that's another way you can try to influence these people um, is to let them know that you're not going to do the same old, same old, which is, you know, supporting these folks because your kids go to school together. Um, I don't know if it's going to change things at the higher levels, but you have to let these folks know. Think about it as a, as a Republican office holder where you campaign to the right and you govern middle left and then – you get reelected and all these people that you know that are really conservative keep supporting you. I mean, why would you change if you can kind of hoodwink them and get away with it? I mean, human nature is that people will try to do that. So you got to let them know you got to withhold the money. Uh, the money's a big deal. Um, so that's the only way you can really do this. And it's the only voice you really have left is withholding money. Isn't that sad? Ah, wow. Terrible, terrible. That's where we've uh, digressed to. Now, on a lighter note, tonight's game night. We're playing Name That Law. Glenn, since you're an attorney, the expectations are going to be kind of high. Uh, but basically, okay. it's just like Name That Tune. But instead of a snippet of music, I'm going to read a small bit of text from a piece of legislation to you. Then you have to name the legislation to win a prize. And if you can guess all four, you're going to win a Prepper Recon fully stocked uh, Molly compatible uh, individual first aid kit IFAC. Those are sweet kits, by the way. So I'm I'm up for it. Let's awesome, go. man. Awesome. Now here's the first one. Uh, an order requiring the production of any tangible things, including books, records, papers, documents, and other items for an investigation to protect against international terrorism. I'm going to say Patriot Act. Awesome. You got it. Nailed it. Nice. Uh, here's, here's the second one. The authority of the president to use all necessary and appropriate force includes the authority to detain any person who has committed a belligerent act, may include detention under the law of war without trial until the end of hostilities. Belligerent act is the NDAA, which is one of the most unconstitutional and horrible things ever done. I remember that from when that was passed. Awesome. You're right again. Now, can you just tell us real quick, uh, is, I'm sure that, uh, you know, for the safety that, you know, they couldn't just lock up anybody for anything. I'm sure there must be some, uh, if for lawyers, there must be some very uh, well-defined uh, definition for a belligerent act. So it can't just be me talking against the government on a, on a, uh, a podcast, right? Yeah, actually, that would count. It's, uh, if I recall from the NDAA, the uh, president, which is really the Defense Department, which is really just a, a military, you know, theoretically commander, 
uh, can can determine these things. And so um, it's pretty much anything. Belligerent Act has no um, well-defined meaning. There have been instances in history in which courts have said that's a belligerent act, but that's different than defining it. So we know that if you are uh, um, German saboteurs uh, in the German Navy and you come, you land on U.S. shore during World War II in a German submarine, we know that that's a belligerent act. But I think everyone would already agree that that was uh, in a declared war, by the way, which is a little bit different than just the president says that uh, it could be all swept up. And that the NDAA is interesting because that's one of those things where I'm like you. I, I don't want to fall for conspiracy theories, and I don't want to fall for hysteria, and I, I just don't want to be that hysterical, uninformed person that takes a fragment of a fact and, and magnifies it. So the NDAA, I remember hearing about it, and I, I thought to myself, oh, right, oh, come on. That just can't happen in America. And then I read it, I mean, a couple sections, the important sections, I don't remember the numbers, but the important sections, and it's all in there. This is not made up. I mean, that's one of the few things we can really say about something that is stirring and horrible and shocking. We can really say this, this is for real. So anyway, the NDAA is indeed for real. It's virtually limitless power. I, I don't really think there's any real power at all. Um, I think maybe you get a appear in front of a military tribunal. Of course, you don't get a real trial. Of course, not with a jury. Of course, not with charges, you know, the civilian court protections that we have. Um, so, yeah, the government can pretty much do anything they want anytime under the NDAA, and that is not hyperbole. That is not Internet wacko talk. That is the law. Okay, here's the next one. It is therefore permissible to restrict the rights of personal freedom, freedom of expression, including the freedom of the press, the freedom to organize and assemble, the privacy of postal, telegraphic, and telephonic communications, warrants for house searches, orders for confiscation, as well as restrictions on property are also permissible beyond the legal limits otherwise prescribed. The word telegraphic indicates to me this is pretty old, and so I don't know is the answer. You don't know? You don't want to take a guess? I don't know. Um... I'll give you a hint. Like, it's okay, not necessary. Sure. All of these are not necessarily uh, American uh, laws. Okay. I would say Soviet Union 1930s or Nazi Germany 1930s. Nazi Germany 1930s. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. That was the okay. Reichstag fire decree, which um, oh, yeah. after after a false flag attack on a uh, a German building, uh, uh, actually a, a German state building. Uh, uh, this was this was drawn up to uh, bring security to uh, to the people and and of course the the ever popular SS was formed um, and uh, and of course that was a, a, a state security organization is is uh, what they were brought out brought about to do. So oh, yeah. that, you, okay, that's another you right one. In the event now here's here's the last one. So you got three out of four so far. So one more and you okay. win the kit. In the event, in the event of a potential threat to the security of the United States, to take actions necessary to ensure the availability of adequate resources and production capability, energy means all forms of energy, including petroleum, gas, electricity, solid fuels, solar, wind, other types of renewable energy, atomic energy, and the production, conservation, use, control and distribution of all these forms of energy. Food resources means all commodities and products that are capable of being ingested by either human beings or animals. Food re resources also means pot potable water packaged in commercially, commercially marketable containers, all starches, sugars, vegetable and animal or marine fats, and oils, seed, cotton, hemp, and flax fiber. Holy smokes. I, this is an executive order from President Obama. I don't remember the number. Uh, I remember this because... Okay. 13603, but that's that's good enough. We'll have to okay. give it to you. Okay. I remember that because when I was writing 299 Days and I was talking about how the government very quickly nationalized just about everything, and I was really focusing on 
the semi truck and the food that would be in the semi truck and the fuel that would be in the semi truck and the drivers that would be basically conscripted to drive. Um, and the government basically shut down civilian traffic on the interstate and just had semi trucks moving to try to feed the cities. Um, that is the executive order I was basing it on. And I felt better coming up with things, I mean, so-called fiction, that was based on what really could happen. Now, I say it could happen in the sense that I guess that executive order exists completely unconstitutional. There was a case in the Korean War where President Truman decided to nationalize all the steel industry and uh, for the Korean War effort, and the Supreme Court said you can't do that. So the Supreme Court, you know, which is not exactly like it used to be, um, would hopefully probably strike this thing down. But then again, that takes years of litigation, and so, so they strike it down, big deal. The president would do it anyway. So this, that's another thing that I remember looking at, and it's not a made-up thing, not a made-up thing at all. And so uh, when you look at all four of these laws together, uh, they're so close, and, and it's very it's, it's hard to pick out which one, you know, for somebody that's not a lawyer that hasn't really just studied law, I, I think that most Americans would be hard-pressed to say, okay, well, this one's from Nazi Germany, and all of these, all the rest of these are modern-day laws that have come into being since September 11th. Yeah, oh, I think so. I mean, they all do basically the same thing. Um, the state wins, and personal freedoms have to come second, and, and it's always in response to some kind of catastrophe, emergency, that kind of thing. So if they are very, very similar. The, the language might be a little different, but it's the same basic thing. And think about this. Any government that would grant itself this power um, will just do it anyway. You know what I mean? You, you don't need these words. I mean, you know, in, in my scenario, in 299 days of economic collapse and you know the government taking over semi trucks and everything a, a semi owner isn't going to say to say you know four or five national guardsmen uh, who are well armed i'm sorry this executive order you just you know told me about is is unconstitutional um so the government would do it anyway but it's kind of scary i just had this realization that when the government actually writes this stuff down isn't that a pretty bold move isn't that a big you know, challenge a big in your face kind of thing. Yeah, we wrote this down. Yeah, we could do this. What are you going to do about it? Um, wow, that's that's even worse than them actually, you know, planning to do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like the it's just like the Snowden revelations, you know, uh, just it, everything's right in your face that they're, they're tracking all your Facebook posts, all your tweets, all of your your uh, your email, uh, all your Skype conversations, everything's everything's being uh, swept up in this huge data net, and uh, and the American people are just complacently sitting by and and letting it happen, and 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 when you put these four pieces of legislation side by side, you know it's hard for me to say that uh, that the Reichstag uh, fire decree from Nazi Germany is any more egregious than the other three that we talked about. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, that's a, a big concern to me as, as a political guy. I mean, I'm a lawyer and stuff, but I'm fascinated by politics and work around politics, how people are getting conditioned uh, to just think these things are okay. And, and I know from listening to one of your past podcasts and previous guests um, how he was describing how, or perhaps you were describing how Jews in Germany would just get conditioned to – accepting this, and, and there was, uh, you mentioned, one or two guards with one or two pistols uh, responsible for 30 people or 40 people getting on a cattle car, and of course, the 30 or 40 people could have easily rushed the guards and not gone off to their deaths, um, but they didn't because they were just conditioned to this, and it took a while to do this. Um, I think it would take less time, it's taking less time, present tense, to condition Americans because, you know, Americans are the majority of them, um, you know, worthless and <laughs> dependent and all of that other stuff. Um, and so they don't really, you know, they're not exactly a, a tough people. Um, so it, oh, it'd probably be easier. I mean, you just, you just tell people that their iPhones will get shut off or the Internet won't work or they can't play video games unless they start turning in patriots. And you're going to start seeing a lot of dirtbag citizens turning in patriots. Absolutely. Kind of like a book. The uh, 
the uh, economic collapse chronicle. I can remember <laughs> or, reading or, about that. Or that 299 was... days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the sad thing is, is if 2015 is the year, uh, we know that, that when this collapse comes, that the government is going to try to use it to to just further suppress our freedom and, and further suppress our rights. And and the laws are already in the books, so uh, it'll just be a matter of instituting them. You know, one thing that um, I've, I've been able to do by talking to elected officials, and not super high-ranking ones, I don't talk to the president or anything crazy like that, but um, state-level folks, one of the things, and I, and I talk about this a lot in 299 days, um, another motive behind all this, when there is a big collapse, the government will, of course, want to take away liberties. And a lot of the reason they would want to do that and have wanted to do it in the past, and historically this is true, is to take care of themselves. Like they want to make sure that those semis are taken over because their folks, their people, their families, the you know their communities are going to get the first crack at the food. Look at Venezuela. Look at the a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And so it's not a, it's not just abstract and theoretical that the government would just like us to have less liberties because they're Saul Alinsky socialists or something. A lot of it's self-preservation, and that's an important thing because when you realize that they just want to take care of themselves, it helps because when you realize that once they've taken care of themselves, they're not going to have the, the energy uh, or the – Really, they're not going to care as much about trying to mess around with other people and control them. If the people out in the hinterland are not going to bother the people in the cities that the government is trying to feed and, and suppress, then the people in the countryside are largely on their own. Um, so, and that's that's reflected uh, in 299 days. So, anyway, I wanted to add that because I've been able to talk to some government folks, and uh, pretty interesting how they're all, not all. I shouldn't say that. Uh, many of them. The ones I've spoken with, I should say, are planning um, to just be off on their own and, and get the first crack at all the good stuff, uh, and they really don't care about much else. And the laws on the books, like you said, uh, Executive Order 13603, and uh, right down to the marine fats and cotton. So if you were thinking about having a whale blubber and denim sandwich, uh-uh, they've got that too. <laughs> And hemp, you mentioned hemp. And That's hemp, also yeah. So all the libertarians that you know that was, and and I'm all about you know deregulating and getting getting the government as far out of my life as possible. Uh, even though I don't smoke pot or or drink or anything else, um, I'm all about that. But for the potheads out there, that that's why you're a libertarian is so that you can smoke your weed, and that was your most important thing. And now you've gotten it, and it and it's it's legal. So I mean, we can come together and change laws and get the government farther out of our lives. But if you don't get if you don't get stuff like this, they're gonna take your pot too, guys. Yeah, <laughs> rise it up. They're gonna take your hemp. Yep. So uh, Glenn, thanks for making time to come back on the show. Where do folks go to get your books? Yeah, 299days.com. Um, that's you know a place to find out more about it. Of course, the best place is Amazon and Audible. The audiobooks are out. And we have Kevin Pierce in common. He is the narrator of your, um, your, your first series. Um, and uh, uh, he's the narrator of my 10 books. And the reason I picked him, and he's amazing and is, I think, the best narrator like ever, uh, is because I heard him reading your books, and I said, man, this guy's good. So uh, every time I'm on, I thank you for, for pointing me towards Kevin Pierce. And uh, so if you like great audiobooks, listen to his audiobooks like the ones written by you and by me. Absolutely. Glenn, thanks again for coming back on the show. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Are we living in a time of which there is more prophetic writings than of any period in history? Noah Parker like many in the United States, has been asleep at the wheel. During his complacency, the founding precepts of America have been slowly, systematically destroyed by a conspiracy that dates back hundreds of years. The signs can no longer be ignored. Watch through the eyes of Noah Parker and his family as a global empire takes shape. Ancient writings are fulfilled, and the last days fall upon the once great United States of America. The Days of Noah, Book One, Conspiracy, by Mark Goodwin, is a fast-paced fiction thriller which looks at how modern conspiracies
prophecies could play into biblical prophecy concerning end times. Buy The Days of Noah in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition at Amazon.com today.